<clears throat> then um, I can say a few words about Alessandra. Um, she is a biomedical engineer who got her a master's at the University in Rome. She is now working in the company Brain Innovations in three years, um, the company that is responsible for Brain Voyager under Rainer Goebel. She's doing her PhD there within this European Union um, grant network. She is a um, contributor to Laney. Uh, specifically, she had ha have had innovations with respect to kind of columnarity, um, quantifications. She's using the UVD filters, uh, these new additions, uh, partly also from, from Farouk um, a lot. She has a, a number of exciting projects, including mostly uh, V5, uh, looking at, uh, and all of them include layers. Um, she Today, she's not going to talk about like the overview of all her projects, her, her kind of research line and research vision. She might, she might do that uh, later this summer. Um, today, she is mostly talking about a project that's almost completely finished and um, she's talking about it today because um, she's about to submit it and is looking forward to feedback from us. The reason for that is also because there were some surprising results um, where she wants kind of um, our opinions on. She has her own interpretations of that so we need to um, hear her out about her, her later slides I guess where she talks about those before we kind of jump in immediately about our interpretations. Um, it's all about the, today about the involvement of the primary visual cortex for this um, um, these uh, motion illusions, the, the motion quartet illusion. I don't have a title, so you um, share your slides and you you say your title yourself. Sure. Thanks so much for the nice introduction and uh, even to invited me here. Okay. So can you see my screen? Okay, so I think I can just start. And uh, please feel free to ask me questions during uh, the talk. It's all good like that. And uh, yeah, so I'm excited to present this uh, uh, work that is still uh, ongoing. And the title of the project is, what is similar to your eyes is not similar to your brain. The stable stimulus reveal insight into feedback connectivity between V1 and HMT plus at laminar resolution. Okay, so just a few words, even if Renzo already did it for me, uh, to introduce myself. So I'm a biomedical engineer and I come from Italy, from Rome. I'm currently uh, in my uh, fourth year or last year of my, my PhD. I'm enrolled uh, as an early stage researcher in the program of uh, European School of Network Neuroscience that is a, a Marie Curie uh, consortium that uh, is composed by 13 entities all over the Europe. And uh, we have a quite broad uh, level of expertise and multimodal and even uh, across different species. And in particular, uh, me uh, together with Reiner, that is my uh, main supervisor, we are interested in a healthy and disease human brain. And uh, with a specific focus on try to advance the understanding of top-down processing. I'm doing my PhD in Maastricht, uh, specifically in the Brain Imaging Center, uh, where actually university, um, company side, and scanner facility, they all come together in this nice place. So I have to say it's pretty nice to do a PhD here. Then I will now give you a very quick overview of my uh, PhD journey, uh, with signposting some of the main projects I've been working on. So the first project when I started was a columnar fMRI project where we actually uh, imaged the columnar functional organization of human area MT plus two axis of motion uh, stimuli. And for that purpose, we used VASO at 70 when also Renzo was here. So the paper is out and uh, yeah, you can check it out and ask me questions at any time if needed. Then uh, in the second project that actually is more focused on understanding the anatomical basis uh, of cortical layers. And for this uh, uh, project, we are doing a collaboration together with uh, Pilou Bazan, and we are look at, looking at different uh, uh, microscopy contrast in different area of the brain, visual area in particular. And then we are trying to uh, create some generative model that can then uh, um, predict the value of quantitative MRI, both in post-mortem, but also in vivo. 
And the last chunk of my PhD uh, has a purely uh, cognitive neuroscience question. So we are interested in a specific uh, um, phenomena that is the bistable motion perception. And to do that, uh, we actually conduct two experiments uh, that are complementary to each other, a whole brain fMRI uh, project. Uh, and with that, we are working together with, uh, with Gustavo Deco, that is still in my grant. And we try to apply some effective connectivity model to understand uh, the mechanisms behind uh, the creation of the motion perception, uh, considering the whole brain. And the counterpart of this experiment is a, a layer fMRI project uh, that is the topic of the day. So study uh, conscious perception always was a hype in the neuroscientific community since the early 80s, I would say. And questions like, uh, how does the brain create the perception? Or what are the mechanisms that can lead to the brain to construct a conscious perception and switch between two uh, equally likely different states uh, drive the neuroscientific community to investigate this not only in humans, but also in animals. And for this purpose, usually multi-stable visual patterns are uh, used. And we have like two categories, let's say, a static illusion when you have like object that while looking at it, according to where you put your uh, silence, silence, you can see it in two different ways. Like for instance, in the Necker cube, you can see it from inside or outside, or the figure ground of reversing stimuli. Here you can see two silhouettes of people like looking at each other, or maybe a vase. Then slightly more complicated and interesting illusion are these moving illusion. And here I just refer to three of them as an example. The apparent motion that is widely used, especially in the uh, human fMRI application, binocular revolvery, or the bistable motion quartet. Uh, but what we know about the neural correlate uh, of the perception, we know that uh, higher visual area and higher cognitive area, they do have a correlate with the perception. They are for sure involved. However, the role of V1 is during the creation of the perception is still unknown. Yeah, there are like a, a diversified results coming up in the community, early fMRI results uh, and more recently fMRI results still in humans that uh, led to different uh, uh, conclusion. Even in uh, 2008, uh, in this study from Mayer and colleagues, they uh, conduct, uh, um, they try to study the perceptual suppression during uh, a B-stable stimuli. So basically, if you have two state, uh, there will be one state uh, that catch your perception and create the perception. And there will be the other state that will be suppressed. And they record the both uh, bold fMRI and uh, spiking activity in monkey. And even here, uh, they found uh, uh, within the same study a divergence of, re of result. So while the bold activity actually goes down during the suppressed case, uh, so highlighting uh, a straightforward correlation with the uh, perceptual creation, the spiking activity doesn't go to zero. You still see that and this is the uh, green curve. So there, there is something going on. And uh, for this basically drove us to, led us to create and set up a new 70 study with some millimeter resolution and try to understand this conscious perception. And uh, to do that, we use a bistable motion quartet as it was previously used also from Schneider et al. in 2019. But now we extend the investigation not only to HMT plus, but also in E1. So we will have a bigger coverage. And uh, similarly, as was done also from Mukli and colleagues in 2005, we will not only look uh, at the active uh, or perceived state, uh, how we want to respond. Yeah, we see that there is a kind of response, but we will also focus on the suppressed condition. So are these voxels even active uh, when they are not recruited to uh, construct the suppression or not? Okay, so let's go now into the uh, experiment and how the stimulus looks like. So now I will give you like just two, three seconds, and I hope that the illusion works even through Zoom. So I will ask you to look at the center of the screen at the red dots and try to focus on it. And while the time is passing, I'm sure that some of you maybe are for sure uh, seeing an illusion. And even the motion, the creation of the motion is switching between the two states. So there is a horizontal motion and a vertical motion. And when I go to the um, 
to a control experiment here. Like there is real motion going on. But if I quickly switch to the previous uh, ambiguous motion, I'm sure that you cannot uh, actually identify if the motion is only created by your brain. So it's a, a perception during due to the multi-stable uh, uh, stimuli or it's a real motion. Okay, let's now uh, make it clear our experimental hypothesis. So in this study, we will look to V1 and HMT plus. We will focus on the ambiguous condition. So the first stimuli where the sensory input is always the same, but only it's your brain that creates and perceives one state versus another one. And we will try to understand which kind of feedback V1 is receiving during this stimulation. So let's say that uh, for now, you are looking at the stimuli and you are perceiving an horizontal motion. So these dots, squares are moving uh, left to right, right to left. So we expect uh, V1 and HMT plus to be uh, differentiated at mesoscale with two different clusters. V1 is a retinotopic organized. So we will have like a horizontal cluster that represents the horizontal patch that we are targeting or the vertical one which um, versus uh, in MT, where we can differentiate a columnar cluster that are tuned by the axis of motion of the direction, basically. And uh, in the first hypothesis, we can think that there is a signal from HMT plus, and now we exclude the rest of the brain for now only for this experiment. That is sending, uh, that is active during the perception of the horizontal motion, but it's also sending uh, somehow a feedback uh, to V1 to the homologous cluster, to the horizontal one. And this is basically fitting uh, with the early fMRI uh, experiment uh, result on this uh, uh, conscious perception. Whereas we can also have another hypothesis where uh, not only the homologous uh, uh, retinotopic cluster in V1 is having uh, a response function, but also the suppressed one, the vertical one, and this might be more similar to what uh, electrophysiology was showing us uh, with the spiking activity being constant uh, in the two conditions, in the perceived one and is in the suppressed one. So our paradigm looks like this. So this is a schematization of the motion quartet. The illusion is created by uh, let them flicker together like the op um, these two uh, pair of uh, square and these two pair of square. And uh, due to the frequency of the alternation, this induces the perception of motion. So during uh, an fMRI run, you will have an entire block of 80 seconds where uh, the stimulus is always the same. It's always flickering. But your brain is switching between different states. And the participant, his task is to report through a button box his perception. So if he's now perceiving horizontal and switching to the vertical and so on and so on. After this state, we have a rest period that is just the four square flickering together. And this is our baseline condition. And all this scheme is repeated for six times. Just as a control, we have this physical motion experiment where there is no perception anymore, but the direction of motion of the squares is dictated by the experimenter. And uh, it's a kind of replay of the ambiguous motion in a bit more uh, simplified way, because we decide to have here constant alternation of uh, uh, switching between states. But the timing uh, is again 80 seconds, and then that is the flicker condition as a, a rest condition. So for this, we collect like uh, 70 uh, data, MRI and fMRI data here in Maastricht. We have a Siemens scanner that recently even went to an upgrade. So it's Magnetum Plus now. And we collect data from nine healthy participants, and we have like two sessions uh, only for the mesoscale and an extra session for the macro scale. And each session lasts for two hours. Uh, over these two sessions, we collect an anatomy, so an MP2 rate, MP rate at 0 0.7 isotropic millimeter resolution. Then we, uh, we collect some localizer runs. One run for a, a lo functional localized uh, HMT plus. It's a very short one. It's only five minutes that we actually analyze online to find the location of HMT plus and then place correctly 
our uh, reduced field of view that we are using for the main experiment. And then uh, again, at the low resolution, we even collect uh, uh, the V1 retinotopic localizer. And for that, uh, we have two runs. Going through the main experiment over the two sessions, we will collect at the end six runs for the physical condition and six runs for the ambiguous condition. Uh, for, for this experiment, we choose to have uh, a 2D gradient echo API board uh, sequence at 0.8 isotropic millimeter resolution and a TR of two seconds. And we decide we have like quite big coverage because we need to go through V1, V2, V3 until V5. And we decide even to not accelerate too much uh, our data so that we can rely on stable and high SNR signal. So the, the way that we analyze the data is the pre-process the data, I would say, is more or less the same from the low resolution data from the localizer and the, the main uh, data from the main experiment, the high resolution data. So we went through a similar uh, pre-processing step in Brain Voyager, like slice time correction, motion correction, distortion correction. Uh, though though did, we did it uh, with top up. Then we use an IPAS filter, and then we consciously decide to align all our fMRI data to a common space that is the anatomical space. And for this purpose, we use boundary-based registration. And we resample our time series to the anatomical space at 0.7 isotropic millimeter resolution. Um, at 0.3 uh, isotropic millimeter, we uh, reconstruct our anatomical surface that were very useful to uh, obtain the region of interest definition. And we did that again in Brain Voyager. So in the retinotopic experiment that uh, uh, led us to obtain the V1, V2 boundary, we use a conventional uh, uh, chromatic uh, moving bar spanning uh, the whole visual field uh, with different orientation. Then we use a population receptive field model based on isotropic 2D Gaussian model with a grid search approach to obtain polar angle and eccentricity map. Based on that, then we manually draw the border between V1, V2, V1, V2, and, uh, and then we, we bring back this to the volume space. For HMT+, plus, we use a conventional uh, paradigm for uh, locate MT that is composed by a main condition where these dots that here look static, they move inwards, outwards, inwards, outwards. And the rest condition is a static condition. So while doing the contrast uh, using uh, a simple general linear model and uh, contrasting moving versus static dot, we can highlight uh, all the activated uh, area, but highlight also the position of HMT plus that we, uh, we know being uh, uh, anatomically defined already here, but uh, end up here in this functional task as a separate uh, cluster. So now we go to the uh, main experiment uh, and we use the 0 0.8 uh, isotropic millimeter fMRI data for the physical motion. So we use, uh, this is very important, we use the physical motion to identify the horizontal and the vertical meso ROI or cluster, let's say, for both V1 and HMT+. So during uh, doing uh, um, a GLM and then looking at the contrast, horizontal bigger than vertical, we can see how uh, within the region we can highlight uh, uh, these two clusters. So this is a, a left uh, hemisphere, a white matter reconstructed surface, and we see that the right part of the, uh, of the stimuli is represented in the in V1. This is the vertical part, the vertical part that goes over all of it, and then in a different retinotopic position, we see uh, half of the horizontal part represented. And then this will uh, uh, then uh, be represented even in uh, V2 and V3 and so on. And for MT, doing, uh, uh, by doing the same approach, we obtain our uh, columnar cluster, the vertical one and the horizontal one that here are indicated with two different colors. Like red will be horizontal and blue uh, vertical. And here is how uh, the map look like uh, in the volume space. Okay, so finally, uh, we have our ambiguous motion condition data. Again, same processing, and we set up our general linear model. So this is a real protocol from a subject that did pretty well, let's say, in the sense that uh, the perceived state 
are more or less uh, with the same duration, but that's not like uh, uh, happening uh, in the same way for all the subjects. But anyway, we set up our general linear model. We believe for now to have sustained response, and we have three predictors, as we have been done for the physical motion, horizontal, vertical, and flicker. And this is how the map looks like. And you can already see that the amplitude of the response is way lower with respect to what we were observing in the physical condition by using the same contrast map. Okay. Then uh, uh, the last part, we are even uh, interested, of course, in uh, uh, investigating the laminar correlate uh, of this phenomena that we are studying. And to do that, uh, we went through a specific processing for the T1 weighted uh, uni images from the MP2H. We obtained an initial segmentation of whole brain uh, from Brain Voyager that we then manual polishing, uh, polished and then used at 0 0.35 to create uh, our uh, surfaces. And then uh, we went back to the volume. We Once we spot uh, and we define our region of interest, we did a, a zoomed segmentation, meaning that uh, we did the extra manual work to be sure that the segmentation is almost um, it's polished in the region of interest. And then we used Laney to compute normalized equivolume cortical depth measurement. And this is uh, how uh, our uh, final ROI look like uh, in the volume space. This is an inside view of V1, and this is empty with this crumbling uh, uh, volumetric uh, shape. OK, so what we are going to focus uh, from now onwards. So we will try to look at the difference between the two main conditions, the uh, physical one and the ambiguous one. Uh, because they should recall something uh, with respect to feed forward uh, and feedback. But to do that, we only constrain uh, our analysis to the perceived space uh, state. And then we look at the laminar modulation. What does it mean? It means that I will select the voxel based on the physical motion, horizontal and vertical, and then I will look at their response in the perceived condition, in the homologous one. So if it's horizontal, it will be horizontal, vertical and vertical. And then we look for laminar modulation. In the second part, we will focus on the difference between the two states, only looking at the ambiguous uh, motion condition. That is the main uh, interesting one. And we try to see what are they doing, this voxel or meso or clusters in the perceived state and when they go to the suppressed state. And even here, we will be looking for uh, laminar modulation. So this is our first result. And we see that uh, uh, this is uh, the result of the general linear model comparing uh, the physical condition and the ambiguous condition for both V1 and MT+. This is a group result and the beta plot. At the end, we only consider eight subjects because one has, uh, was excluded due to motion. And uh, uh, when I, what I labeled as a physical and ambiguous condition is the summation, the conjunction effect of uh, um, responding to motion, both considering horizontal motion or vertical motion. And we can immediately see that V1 is responding uh, as expected uh, quite nicely in the physical condition, but it decreases substantially during the ambiguous condition. And this is not happening uh, for HMT+. Plus that uh, is showing uh, a more or less consistent, uh, uh, even a little bit decreased, but activity uh, in the ambiguous condition versus the physical condition. I even report here the flicker condition, that is our baseline, and is different perceived uh, in the two experiments, in the physical one and the uh, ambiguous one. And by doing then the subtraction of the two conditions, we can try to look at the overall difference between the main uh, experiment. And again, V1 is very high in the physical and even became negative with respect to the flicker condition in the ambiguous one. Whereas MT is uh, stable and even look higher during the ambiguous condition with respect to its own flicker uh, baseline. So this is our first take home message. Wait, wait um, could you remind me about the RIs? And uh, probably you said it. So this is across entire V1. This is not two specific kind of parts of the retinotopics field where you would have that motion. So 
we basically select uh, our uh, uh, cluster in V1 and MT. Then from this subset of voxel, I only consider the betas of the corresponding condition. So in the horizontal cluster, I will take the betas from the horizontal condition. In the vertical one, from the vertical condition. And then I average them together. So because our goal here is to compare V1 and MT during a physical and ambiguous in the perceived state. So with the assumption that these voxel are keeping their preference while passing through the ambiguous condition. Gotcha. So there is already like for physical alone, and we are always looking to the kind of preferred physical versus the, the other condition. Okay. Yes. Gotcha. gotcha. Okay. Okay. So uh, now we uh, we are looking to the event related uh, average. So again, as we did before, instead of uh, extracting only the betas corresponding to the uh, perceived condition with respect to the cluster, we extract the block, the, the epochs related to the specific condition. And uh, if we average them together and a cross participant, this is the profile that we end up having. So we see that V1, as expected, is responding as a textbook-like hemodynamic shape in the physical condition. In the ambiguous condition, uh, we see that both V1 and MT, they uh, shorten their response. So it seems that the response is not anymore sustained as we were modeling, but it, it's way shorter, maybe it's more uh, transient. And this is the feature that we see in the two area. Another uh, uh, part of, uh, or detail that we highlight here is also the shape of HMT plus response during the physical condition. It, this is a characteristic shape uh, that presents even this early undershoot that was already uh, found and discussed in previous paper. And uh, here I just mentioned a uh, few of them. Okay, so with the same rational, now I'm, mm, I'm looking at the layer profile. So we collapse the temporal information that we see here, and we went back to the, um, to the betas that summarize what we are seeing here, and just look across that. And what we see, we see that, okay, while uh, HMT plus that is presented here on the right, the shape of the layer profile is way similar between the two condition. And if we do the difference between these two line, let's say, because uh, we decide to have this kind of approach due to even uh, the choice of our sequence, gradient echo uh, bold, that then is uh, affected by the draining vein, as we all know. We do the subtraction, try to mitigate the effort, but we don't see any um, emerging uh, different patterns. What is interesting is that V1 is actually changing its profile. So we see a decrease of amplitude towards uh, surface. And this might recall a bit of a deactivation of that voxel that we were supposed to be active because we are perceiving uh, the specific, the correspondent motion, but we see a decrease. And if I uh, do the difference between the two curves, and here I'm doing the modulus, uh, taking just the absolute value uh, and then minus the absolute values of this curve, I do see a common trend of the draining vein and not extra uh, feature. For the laminar profile, uh, every time since we are using the beta and we are averaging a cross participant, we decide to uh, compute a kind of percent signal change, but with respect to a specific layer, a deep layer. So we do this normalization and then we average across all participants. And this is what we, we saw. Okay, so now we go to the second part of our focus. We are already familiar with the colored uh, line. This is again a group result with event-related average. And the colored line is what we saw before. So the voxel in their perceived condition. Whereas the black line is the voxel now in their suppressed condition. And this is very interesting because we were expecting to not see a response. So we thought that the, uh, the cluster that is not recruited 
to see, to create the perception was not showing uh, any activity. Whereas here we see that there is activity. And there is a shape that is quite similar to the perceived condition, but one main difference comes to our eyes. There is a different undershoot. So in the perceived, there is a nice undershoot. In the suppressed condition, there is no undershoot. Whereas uh, for HMT+, plus, we do see that, um, yes, I see yeah. everything so, then. Hi, so this is a bit of a follow-up to Renzo's question earlier. Um, I'm still trying to get a, a good handle on what regions we're looking at here, because there's in both, especially in V1, mm -hmm. there's the areas where, um, you know, we, we know there's a direct visual stimulus and then the areas that perceived motion or these RI and, and then there's perceived motion in both directions. So how, how exactly are the RIs yes. being chosen for this? I just want to make sure I got this clear because it's, it's yes. central to I everything. Yeah, I think this maybe will help if I spend two more minutes. Um, give me feedback if that's the case. So okay. B1, we said that uh, it's retinotopically organized. Mm -hmm. So we have two cluster of voxel into that correspond to two different location in the visual field, right? And mm -hmm. we, we call them uh, horizontal clusters and vertical clusters. And same but with a different principle behind, we define this cluster for HMT+. So we will have a columnar cluster that is tuned to the horizontal motion and the vertical one that, uh, and another one that is tuned to the vertical. Now, let's say that you are perceiving an horizontal motion. You are perceiving this motion. So you expect to see the horizontal cluster of MT being activated and you expect to have the horizontal cluster of V1 um, to be activated because you see move, stuff moving. So there might be a, an internal representation of this motion in V1 in the same direction. So when I say, uh, when I talk about uh, active condition or perceived condition, I mean this, I'm taking uh, the betas of the cluster responding to the corresponding motion. So it would be horizontal, horizontal, vertical, vertical. And then I just collapse them because I don't expect to see any differences. Okay. Yeah. When, I, uh, when I say suppressed motion, I mean that I'm looking uh, to the same, like to, let's say, um, if you are perceiving horizontal, I'm looking to the opposite uh, cluster. That is the vertical one. Mm -hmm. So what is doing the vertical one? Is it responding still, even if I'm perceiving the opposite condition or not? This is the question. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Yes. Um, sorry, Tanya, do you want to go first? I, I was just curious. And so because, I mean, V5 also has a retinotopic representation. So I was mm -hmm. curious if you also did any of these analyses by actually looking at the location specified columns rather than the motion specified columns? Uh, we actually did not do this control in MT because we based on assumption of columnar cluster from my previous study, but specifically to the Schneider study that he only study MT and the, he, he showed his columnar cluster being activated for the motion during the physical, and then uh, the same cluster are also activated in the uh, ambiguous motion. And I did uh, all a control experiment to differentiate what you are just you, you just asked. That's why I did not do it again. But. But surely there could be relationships between the retinotopic locations of the two areas, right? I mean, so from from their control analysis, they didn't come up with this uh, uh, outcome. But that there is a there is a relation between the two, but they could still like uh, explain that what they observe is not only retinotopically driven. Okay. Alessandro, I just wanted to ask quickly, you're making comparisons between the physical uh, motion and the perceived motion. Mm -hmm. um, 
But if I understand correctly, there is uh, more visual information for the physical motion in comparison to the perceived motion. And could that not just explain why you have these activation differences? Um, you mean because the kind of uh, stimulus that we are perceiving during the ambiguous motion is less vivid. Therefore, uh, it brings us less activity. What do you mean? Yeah, not necessarily less vivid, just physically there is more stimulus on the screen for the physical yes. motion than there is for the uh, perceived motion. So yeah. an increase in activity in the early visual cortex may just be a response of just yes. more information on the screen. Yes, totally. And okay. uh, this is like, mm, so we have this physical condition really as a control condition. So we do expect okay. to have a higher activity, but the yeah, interesting... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just wondering, so if you go to a couple of slides uh, before we, we stop, so you're doing a comparison between these two. Here, you mean, right? And I was wondering, uh, yeah, what else would this tell us other than there is just more stimulus on the screen? Uh, well, not more than that, uh, in a way. Okay. Okay. Like you would expect, uh, like, um, I don't know if you pay attention to the stimuli, when you saw it, uh, uh, the ambiguous condition, at least when I do the task uh, and also my participant, they really feel no difference between the physical condition and the ambiguous condition. So as, a, as our eyes perceive the stimuli, they are more or less uh, uh, similar. So you might expect to trick your brain and then have uh, the same amount of am amplitude activation maybe, just a little bit decreased or not. And yeah, the, exactly, yeah. which you would see in HMT because you're perceiving motion, but in V1, V1 is responding to the, the stimulus there is more of, which is in the physical condition. Yes, and indeed, okay. like you see that, uh, for instance, V1 is more correlated to the um, perception, and it, it doesn't care if it's like uh, physical or ambiguous. This is what is actually telling us this light. Right. The activity is similar, whereas in V1, even if you might think and going through the same reasoning for uh, MT to have the same response, whereas what we observe is different. Now, V1 just decreased down. So early processing decreased. Right. Okay. okay. I think I can go back to where we stopped. And I think we were here. So now introducing the second part. So we are familiar with the colored curves that now we understand that we are taking the voxel, the patches in their uh, corresponding uh, uh, perceived condition. And the black one is what is happening to the same population, but when they are not recruited to create the perception. So in the suppressed condition. And we were uh, interested uh, to this shape uh, that we do find in V1. So there is still activation. They are activated somehow. And uh, if we look at MT, we see that uh, there is a beginning of an activation, but then it goes down in the suppressed condition. So this, we can speculate uh, and think that it might represent in competition between the two cluster. So during the perception, while you are creating uh, what you are seeing, uh, both population in MT might be active, but then, then one win over the other one and keep its response being positive and the other one going down. Okay, so now we um, ex extend what we saw before in terms of layers. So we look at the temporal response, but also with the spatial extra dimension. And here in each graph, like we increase the intensity of the color to evocate the going from the deep layer to the superficial layers. And uh, yeah, we do observe the same things, of course, as what we were observing before. So the nice undershoot happening in V1 during the perceived condition and not undershoot in the suppressed condition. There are many discussion right, over what is what is the meaning of an undershoot? 
And here we can even uh, try to speculate uh, while uh, in one case uh, we have it uh, and in the other case when the voxel should not be recruited uh, in the perception that is not understood. And we can maybe speculate that there is a difference in between uh, excitatory and inhibitory population and then how this can go back to their uh, balance at the beginning uh, might be different in between the two conditions. But really just speculative from my side, at least. We observe few more features. So while uh, in the perceived condition, we go up sharply and then down sharply again, the suppressed condition seems to occur slightly later, being a little bit more sustained in time and then co goes down. So this might lead us to think that there are two different dynamics going on. Finally, we do the suppression again of the information uh, from the temporal point of view. We use again the betas, but now we look at the cortical depth in the two conditions, perceived and suppressed. And even if we do see that there is a decrease in the both condition, we, when we do the difference between them, and yet again, I do the uh, absolute value of one curve, subtract the absolute value of the other curves, we do observe something that might be taken maybe with a grain of salt, but is at least not only uh, giving us a straight line. So we see that we cannot talk really about the direction of the modulation, if it's like more active or less active, but we do see a pattern. So where the middle layer is the most deactivated, most affected in a way, and then the superficial and the deep doing something maybe different. And this is not happening uh, for HMT plus, like its curve are having the same um, basically shape, and they are just one scaled version of another one. Wait, I, uh, I'm not sure yeah. if I fully understand this. Now, wait, uh, sorry if I'm slow. The, the perceived versus suppressed is now referring to the kind of congruent, like when you look at the clusters of the, um, why are you calling it suppressed and not ambiguous now? Um, it uh, Because you're now looking at uh, the different time scale, right? You're looking at a, or you say you, you're looking at beta scores, but you still have the HRF of of a canonical, um, like the canonical yes. HRF. Yes. So first, you're right. I'm still in the beginning of my modeling. I like uh, have a sustained response in the same way of the physical motion. But here we are only looking at the ambiguous condition. And as I said before, we like differentiate two states. One that I call perceived, where I pull voxel and I take their epochs or beta value in the corresponding perceived condition. So it would be horizontal class, horizontal condition. Whereas in the suppressed one, it's the other way around. I take the horizontal voxel and I look how do they respond in the vertical condition. All right. That's what I figured. So, yeah. and, and you look at the overall beta. And yes. of course, this go positive, but the betas go negative. Uh, yes, across layers, right? And this is can be explained because I'm modeling something like this. We can simplify with a box car, and we expect that like the under should come here, so right? And here you have more negative. The under shoot is like going even down. Okay, right? so and that's why like the betas is actually negative with respect to what you are assuming. Gotcha. Or so more Alexander, negative. Yeah. On, on the next one, your D players are at zero though. And that's not what's on the previous one. I, are these showing in ratio to the D players or? Uh, yes, it's the same uh, rational that I show you the layer profile before. Before averaging uh, be, between uh, uh, across a uh, uh, subject, I compute uh, a percent signal change with respect to the deep layer. So I subtract the deep layer from the middle and then to the superficial one, and then I average across subject. That's why the deep layer is zero. 
It's always zero in all my plot. It's Why? just a choice. Okay. And the two, like the perceived versus suppressed, uh, the purple and black line on the left graph, they kind of diverge towards the surface, right? Yes. And so the beta difference is a, then a normalized difference of those, right? Otherwise, it would also go bigger and bigger towards the surface. So I'm not really sure how you get from the left layer profile to the second to left layer profile. So I take this value. Right. And then in modulo, in absolute value. Okay, so let's think that is positive, basically. And then I subtract the absolute value of this three value. Because I, I'm not interested to now understand and like to keep the sign here. And then if you do this difference, this is what comes out. Okay. Um, okay, and you do this on a participant by participant basis uh, with the yes. Okay. Yes. Because if yes. you would take the black and the purple and subtract it, you would not get the second plot, right? I believe. It's like the other way. On the average, if you average first. Right. Yeah, try to like look at them in the semi-positive spot, right? And then if you subtract them, you will see this shape like this. I, I think I understand, yes. Okay. Okay. And this is even like my basically last slide of result. So I can go quickly oops, to the conclusion and open question maybe. So in this study, like to summarize, our result seems to support the hypothesis for which there is a V1 signal from the cluster in both the suppressed and the perceived state. So more like uh, understanding and referring to this uh, kind of schematic hypothesis. We can factually say that V1 and HMT plus response during the ambiguous motion is shorter. So it's not any more sustained, but it's more like transit wipe. We can say that the temporal profile of V1 retinotopic cluster are different between the perceived versus the suppressed shape. So there is a difference in undershoot. It might indicate a different excitatory inhibitory balance or some other processing. And finally, uh, what we just saw before, we saw that like superficial deep layers have a different modulation. We don't say any sign with that, with respect to the middle layers for the perceived condition versus the suppressed condition. And this is only something that we look in the ambiguous motion. So maybe uh, another open question, future direction, which we now use a very simple model. And uh, that seems to not fully fulfill our data. So maybe in the future, we can think to improve our modeling side and use more data-driven approach to estimate our HRF. And maybe this will even clarify the laminar profile, the, the result that we just saw. And yeah, with this, I would like to thank you all for the attention. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. So <clears throat> I, have, I have a question. Um, could you uh, expand a little bit on your thoughts on on you, you said? Well, it could be an inhibition or excitation. Is it? In, is the idea there that uh, based on maybe Camille Ludog's paper that like inhibitory activity has like a, a, a longer time course course and it causes or more metabolic demand and you know causes or or maybe less. I don't know. I mean, less. I'm not sure exactly what the hypothesis is there or what the thought is, at least there, in terms of talking about inhibitory or excitatory balance. Yeah. So thanks for the question and the pointers, because this is a very exciting part of the study. And we are working on the interpretation. And this is just one of them that it might fit or might also not be true. So my thought on that is that during when you are perceiving something, there is MT that sending, uh, or let's say deciding MT or another higher area, what you are perceiving in that moment. And then it's sending back a feedback to both clusters in V1. One cluster might receive an excitatory feedback because you do see perceive 
the condition happening. But the other cluster needs to also shut down in a way. It needs to be suppressed. And to be suppressed, it, it doesn't know. If you only look at V1, you don't have any information of what you are perceiving in theory. Therefore, it, there cannot be a lateral connectivity within V1. But this other cluster should be inhibited by someone in a way. It might be MT or another area, but let's not be there. And maybe who is receiving the feedback there is not the excitatory neuron, but they are the inhibitory neuron. But we actually don't know, or at least I don't know to my knowledge, how the hemodynamic response will change if you receive a feedback directly on the inhibitory neurons and then uh, um, like what is its modulation? Because from what we know from Uludag and all this simulation is modeling, he always assumed that the connectivity, the feedback comes to the excitatory population. And then there is a coupling function with respect to the inhibitory one and so on and so on. But the other way, so if the feedback reached directly the inhibitory neurons, this is, I couldn't find any uh, strong literature on that, that would uh, then have an, I don't know, a better idea. So this is just my mind wandering. But I yeah, think we cannot exclude to begin with, probably. Yeah, it's really interesting. It's, it is potentially a probe to understand whether that manifests itself in the bold signal. So that'd be, that'd be really cool. Um, one other quick question. Um, uh, I've often, I'm thinking also, it would be interesting, you know, maybe as a complementary study to to try to also map the orientation selectivity just of static, like, you know, gratings, like either mm -hmm. vertical or horizontal to see if there's any overlap in the pattern of V1 activity with the illusion of horizontal motion or vertical motion uh, with, mm -hmm. you know, what you would get with gratings that are vertical or horizontal to see if there's an overlap there, if it aligns with like orientation columns or things like that, whether that's somehow that information is uh, mm -hmm. determining that. Um, so. Well, in, in if I understood correctly, your question is related to V1. So orientation columns in V1, we know that they are pretty small. Right, so right. If um, we could have like higher resolution, sure, we could toggle this. However, in the sake of this study and understanding this perception with this specific uh, stimuli, I'm not generalizing this one, the physical condition, it works as a localizer. It literally loca locate the activation where it has to be with respect to the external visual field. So I do not feel this choice of uh, obtaining the retinotopic cluster as a limitation. So having gratings, Sure, but then you also like have a, a different retinotopic space to be activated. Yeah. So yeah, another like interesting outcome or discussion might also be that during the ambiguous condition, the receptive field actually move place. So where we expect to see the horizontal patch. And we, because now we are looking at that patch. Maybe this patch, it moved in the cortex due to attention. And there are like study that shows actually this kind of uh, feature happening. So another uh, like way of looking at this data might also be to obtain a new or ba uh, ambiguous based retinotopy clusters in V1 and then look there because maybe the sustained response is there, or maybe not, but yeah. just, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. I have a small question about the processing uh, style. Like, um, um, you kind of normalize everything with respect to deep layers and then getting like subject specific responses with the perceived and suppressed. But uh, there's a huge effort put previously on localizing those um, 
um, responses. So actually, like if you're sure that responses are localized and subject specific, all the responses could be pulled in one big perceived and one big suppressed. Then mm -hmm. getting the average responses would lead uh, different results rather than having like subject specific averages and trying to get uh, uh, group results from that. What do you think of? Do you think it will lead differently? So thanks for the question. So the choice of doing this normalization within subject is because it was driven by the fact that different like paths and different fMRI session leads to a different baseline in the fMRI signal itself. And we need to somehow correct for it. So since in our study, we do not have a, a real uh, baseline, or a baseline that is working in the same way for the physical versus the ambiguous condition, we decide to choose uh, to not do a normalization of the time course to begin with. So our time course, they have their own uh, mean, let's say. And then the beta is computed with respect to the mean of the run. And it's not scaled. Uh, it's not just varying between 0 and 1. That's why the beta fluctuate differently echoing uh, the different amplitude of the fMRI signal that is specific to the subject. So say that uh, we came up with this normalization using one layer specific and then try to mitigate uh, this difference between subject. So if you would not have done this, it might be that one subject, since his uh, time course is scaled differently, way differently, the betas might be very different with respect to the to the group and would mislead our result. Whereas in this way, the, we reduce the variance. And indeed, you see that a cross subject is not like super big. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's the reason. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, I mean, with subject to subject uh, differences, but there is also within subject trial to trial differences may also have this variation. So that's why like would be nice to have all the responses pooled together would uh would i i don't think mm. they will be uh, the, kind of yeah so uh all response pooled together this is what i'm showing uh, in the event related average mm -hmm. where i just normal for uh, um reducing the variance that you just mentioned i use the first time point to compute a relative person signal change and then i do the um the average. So this is this state for the event related average. Okay. For the uh, for the um, for the layer profile and the use of beta, we decide to like go through this path and use the normalization of the deep layer. Maybe last small one. Why do you think mid mid layer is more responsive or more going up and down than the others? Uh, yeah, this I don't know, actually. I don't have a clear thought. I mean, I can speculate and say that since the perceived condition, somehow mm, the voxels are still responding, so are still creating something. So there is maybe a traces of, um, like we are eliminating in a way the fit forward information. And that's why we might think that not having or having a different behavior for the middle layers might reflect that now we are in the feedback stage where uh, like superficial and mid, mid uh, and, and deep layers, they play uh, a role and the middle one is going, uh, is downgraded basically in a way. As I said, do not, like I'm not interpreting the shape of it like in, in terms of amplitude, who is like bigger than the other, because it's even in the lower subfield. So it's like negative for now. So it, it makes hard to think about it. But I think the point that I want to convey is that there is some differences in the shape. And uh, yeah, if they are uh, really telling us something on the feedback, I would be happy <laughs> with this interpretation. <laughs> but I'm also cautious about that. Yeah. Uh, there's one question. Um, hey, um, thanks, uh, uh, Alessandra. It was a great talk, and uh, 
Um, I was wondering, it might be related to previous questions as well. Like how long is the experiment and the, the uh, during the experiment, uh, would you, uh, how will be the um, different layers response uh, patterns may change? Um, uh, I didn't fully understand. So the experiment, one run is 10 minutes. And then um, the, the block task that in the um, ambiguous motion is the same timing of the physical motion. So it's 80 seconds. And then people, just by pressing a button box, they convey their response. If they are perceiving horizontal, and then switching to vertical, and so on, and so on, and so on. So, so I am trying to relate it to, like, if you have a mental fatigue or some mm, the bright state of the brain, uh, how mm -hmm. will it possibly change the maybe excitability of the cortex? Um, and yeah, that's what I was wondering. If it was like an hour long experiment, how would be the patterns change, you know, like in the perception? I see. Like you are now hinting to the fact that going through the entire experiment, there might be some fatigue in our brain that would change the shape of the response. So um, empirically, as a, with a, this data-driven approach, when I look at the um, event-related average, so single trial, and I look at them over time, over the run, and even across the two sessions, I do not observe a huge variability. So, and this m does not exclude what you just said, because it may also be that people got uh, habituated pretty soon, pretty fast. So after the two trials, let's say two blocks, then maybe the, the response became sustained. And this would explain why I do not see a huge variability across trial over time. Okay, and one more thing maybe quickly, like is there, maybe it's, it might be a general question to other people too, like is there a, a GABA glutamate a kind of uh, ratio differences uh, across layers, individual cortex? So this is a very nice question, and I'm happy that you mentioned this point, because in a way, it circled back also to my anatomical investigation of the layers with using microscopy. So at the moment, I it's not well known if in B1 or in MT, there is a different ratio of excitatory and inhibitory neurons across layers. This is unknown. That's, one of the reasons uh, why I was interested in trying to understand if this is actually the case uh, by using uh, microscopy data that they have different contrasts, uh, one that can toggle all the neurons. And then we have, uh, um, I'm talking about uh, Bielonsky contrast and parvalbumin that will toggle uh, the interneurons not specifically the GABA, but a different kind, and then try to understand if this ratio is constant across uh, layers within V1, and is, if it's constant uh, across layer in MT. So, but at the moment, yeah. I don't know. So if someone yeah. else <laughs> would that yeah. something, yeah. I would be happy. Yeah, you, uh, you are pursuing it uh, very nice. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, just uh, just coming in. Uh, I, sorry, I missed the first part, but um, but yeah. So I think I heard a talk by Anna Devore uh, at the workshop, and which she, and also I think there's there's work. Oh, um, and she actually mentioned she sort of described uh, inhibitory versus excitatory uh, neur neuron populations across layers, and and I'm trying to recall specifically what she was saying. I think that she was saying that like layer four or five was more. Uh, Inhibitory, I could be wrong though. And she was also saying though that the inhibitory neurons are are uh, highly, they're like invisible to bold in some sense. She was trying to say that they're uh, not metabolically active enough to drive bold as much. Um, mm -hmm. So 
but then again, it's very early days in terms of uh, really understanding this. But um, so Anna Devore, I think, had has a, probably has a paper on this. Um, yeah, uh, and but she does a research in uh, rats, right? Yeah, yeah. So it could all be different. Yeah, I see. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, like also try to understand that work as well. So yeah. to get an insight. Well, also there was a review article on layers by Carl Zillis. Uh, in which I thought they broke it down across inhibitory, predominantly inhibitory versus excitatory, or also it was GABA concentrations or something like that as well, um, that had a really nice, nice data. So. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. It's a bit tricky to, I think, derive conclusion on excitatory and inhibitory neurons. If you look at like postmortem data and then you stain them, right, versus what is happening in the human brain in a task and with respect to the metabolic demand. So it's nice to pull all this information from different species and methodology to then try to maybe build up something for the human. Yeah. Uh, and the, yeah it, thanks for the suggestion. Sure. And, and yeah, the one other paper, two other papers by Sanji Kim also talk about this as well. Um, uh, and I, yeah, they're not exactly... They don't kind of fit together completely, but uh, but either way, it's interesting. Sanji has some kind of nice papers on inhibitory activity as revealed by Bold. So, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. All right. Um, I think we are um, over the hour. Thanks a lot, everybody. Um, the next meeting will be on April third uh, in two weeks. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.